there's not a black architecture per se that's established, but there's a black art that's established and it's not one thing. You know, there's every type of black art and pigeonhole it. And I want the same to be for, for black architecture. Now we're repurposing the burglar bars and allowing it to be the focal point of the facade, of turning off the ugliest thing into the most beautiful thing that's black. Hi, my name is Damar Matthews, I'm the founder and principal of Off Top Design Studio out of Los Angeles. Unearthing a Black aesthetic is based out of developing an architectural language that is derived purely from Black culture, different Black neighborhoods in America. So where we're starting off with house number one is in Watts, a small neighborhood in South LA. Common aesthetics in Black, black culture, really things that are specific to uh, Watts well, the acronym that Watt started kind of been known by, uh, we are taught to survive. Known that like my whole life, but I just never realized. True and Watts is true for a lot of black neighborhoods. Uh, we are taught to survive when all the other communities or people are being taught to drive. As I look at this as an adult, how do we allow black architects to speak to allowing black people to drive? Here's where I kind of started to really form the aesthetic. And so to begin, I made this taxonomy of uh, Black architectural characteristics. So I would take words, which were kind of descriptive words that I would get from film, to music, or from poetry, etc. But always from Black people describing Black people or describing Black culture. And I would take one word at a time that they were using and I would just put it on um, all words that Black people used. First began by taking buildings or designs from black architects and African architects. And then on the other taxonomy, which is one of black art aesthetics and techniques, I started to apply that same rule to art. So here you'll see Titus, Barnes, Bikini Wiley, Ernie Barnes, or all the Bosque, uh, etc. Then I was also heavily influenced by uh, Afrofuturism. Of course, architecture is always imitating art, but I don't think it, it's been true that there's been architecture that's been imitating Black art. Like, what is what is the Basia thing look like in an architectural form or a Titus Kafari? I really focused on these three for this project. Afrofuturism piece that you see here, what I really appreciate about it is certain colors that they use that highlights Black skin and also the the gold disc that they're constantly putting around the black person's face or the subject's face, and they're doing that to speak, which of course is a nod to um, classic painters. The way that they do it and why they're doing it is for perception. So you are seeing black person or the black skin as, as royal. Hmm. We're just getting that that look, but we're getting it a lot later than everyone else is getting those looks. The same reason Titus Kabar was painting everyone painting over every all the white people in classic paintings, but leaving the slave who was typically the one who was visually the lowest. So it was very heavy to try and bring out bring out things like this in the art, abstractions that artists are doing because there's not a black architecture per se that's established, but there's a black art that's established and it's not one thing. You know, there's every type of black art can't pigeonhole it. And I want the same to be for black artist and here by Ernie Barnes he's speaking to body language of, of black people in such a specific way how fluid the movements are no other culture could have this painting to reflect their dance it's not going to look like this it's going to be a little different their body is going to be contorted a little different I think this one is particular to our style of it. but how can I celebrate our dance and architecture and structural elements and lastly, this piece by Kahin Wiley is really the most powerful thing about this is what he did of taking a black man in his natural image, right? This seems like something he'd wear every day because it's a common, you know, it's just a sweatsuit of tan. I can automatically assume he's from New York. And to see him um, represented in this way kind of seems royal. And I think that that's very uncommon in a black man is seen as royal. And really, if, if this background were taken off, if this slight kind of surrealist 
view of him was was changed, then people are not going to see him the same way. A lot of people are going to see him as a thug because he got a sweatsuit and Tim's on. But what the art did and what his background did, it changed perception. And that's what I'm interested in. But not for the user, more so for us. You know, I'm trying, I'm interested in self perception too, because I'm wondering how he saw himself after this. I think if I were trying to create something just from scratch, I don't think it would be as effective. I think here, if we use not only black art, but things like established black techniques, aesthetics, or uh, ideas of beauty, black experience, that shared experience, um, certain traditions. I think that all of this, of course, art has been able to translate that already, but I don't think that it would be simply an art. I think art is a, a strong component in something that hasn't been translated into architecture um, in terms of black art, but um, I don't see it as the only translator. I see it just being one of the things that things. This definitely takes a nod from Ernie Barnes and Sugar Shack Payne. I think of if I was a column, you know, if a black man is a column and we're basing it off of this dance, if this is a black dance, what does this image look like for a Mexican culture, for a Chinese culture, European culture? To see what is that for column? What's black culture column? How do we speak to our body language, posture, to our dance, to our hand shapes? Um, this is where kind of some of the barriers established techniques, uh, things like our hair, but for us especially, our hair. So for women, box braids is very popular. My niece, my mom, my sister, have all my box braids are half them. They're, you know, my niece just turned 13, but she's been doing her own hair since she was you know, eight years old. And to do these really meticulous designs that have these sort of geometric patterns in them and you know, they look kind of, they look really perfect. There's like an art to that, but it's not even celebrated as much. You know, how do I celebrate this? How do I celebrate this black technique in architecture? Um, how do I celebrate the ability to get these waves? Understanding this process, when I used to have waves, I am brushing the hell out of my hair for a month <laughs> and a half, you know? And I, you gotta have a do-rag on so tight at all times, you know, and it's these things that are I can say names about these waves that somebody else may not get that I'm talking about waves. It's like this coded language, you know, to, to these things. And so I wanted to bring both of those into, into architecture. So here is the site and it's directly next to the towers. We have about 13,000 square feet. Currently you'll see there's about 15 to 18 different fruits and vegetables fully grown. Most Sundays, people come down there and grab some food when we're there. So I translated it and kind of abstracted it into a flat pattern. And really, this now is the architecture skin that hangs on the facade of the building. The material is actually repurposed. Um, it's the same metal bars that you would see hanging from the doors and the windows. Now we're repurposing these bourbon bars and allowing it to be the focal point of the facade, of turning off the ugliest thing into the most beautiful thing that's black. The idea of hosting space, and it's just kind of a story related to it. I was at a Destination Crenshaw's groundbreaking. There's a bunch of people dancing, so there's you know music playing. There's some families just lined up along the curb, I kind of dancing a little bit, but they wouldn't like get off the curb. To yeah. space. And I was wondering why, and they all happen to be white families. This is a really black neighborhood, and there's a lot of black and brown people there. Today I'm asking one of my classmates why, and he said, hey, well, that's not my space. I, I wouldn't have felt comfortable. And I'm looking around because I was the only black dude in my grad class for three years. I asked him, like, you think that I feel like this is my space, or like I feel comfortable here? So really this, how often are would he come into that neighborhood? You know, if he's uncomfortable, come just like the people who were um, not ready to fully dive in, experience that culture, experience that dance. While we're building a, a very black architecture, an unapologetically black architecture, we still want an inclusive community. Mm. Uh, we want everybody to be able to come into the space. We, it's really important to be able to establish a place of commerce here 
that allows people to spend money and allow for the community to grow, but for them to be the ones who are taking advantage of that growth. Building a bridge to welcome more people in to learn about and experience it and, and, and have pride in it. Exactly, and there's, there's not many black landmarks. If there are, it's, it's only for us. Hmm. Nobody else is going to go take a picture by. It. You know, when you go to Beverly Hills, if you got 30 things to take a picture by or, or post, you know, you're, you're going to go there and you're going to spend money over there too. But you need to spend money in the black neighborhoods as well. This is the rendering of kind of in between the ADE, which is new construction, proposed maker space, power tools, weld, welding machine, spray paint, and to fabricate three 3D printers, a workspace, and a little podcast center and a restroom. These are a couple of the newer benches that we have right now that'll allow calm, serene space looking at the front of the ADU. Uh, we have a pretty long fence line. It's almost 300 feet. Usually the fence is just seen as barrier or a wall. Uh, how can we now make it this living thing that has something to offer everyone? How do we start to allow the public to have access to all these vegetables and fruits that are growing? We make them available for free along the fence line with this new design. The next mm -hmm. section of the fence is the public library, it's sort of little covers on them for the rain. But that section of the fence is broken down and it's for the community. Hopefully kids, for the most part, are able to exhibit their own work, show their art, it's a place to display fine art just in the exterior. The Architecture and Design Museum of LA, they are the fiscal sponsor. They're a 501c3, so everyone who donates will be you know, fully tax deductible. Um, and in terms of design partners, the, for the ADU, I designed that Steinberg Hart is going to be the AOR for ADU. And Gensler is partner for the renovation and design of the existing shotgun house. And Studio MLA just came on as our landscape partner. Hopefully by the end of the breakdown, we really are trying to provide a space to stay, to come in and stay at Watts, stay in the towers, public exhibitions, public teaching. How do we just reactivate that and allow this a place for exchange? Well, Damar, thank you so much for your time. Oh man, no problem. And thank you. We're working together, man. We're partnering through this thing to take it and go.